Humongous Entertainment. This name may not ring any bells for the majority of children nowadays, but as a child who grew up in the late 1990s and 2000s, Humongous was a common household name that many people my age knew back then, or at the very least, their most iconic characters. Putt-Putt, Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam, and Spy Fox. These were characters that impacted the lives of a generation as they took children on adventures from the deep sea trenches of the Atlantic Ocean to the far off reaches of the land of darkness. Humongous was the children's adventure game developer of the 1990s and touched the lives of many young children that were just starting to learn about the world around them. Before the days of easily accessible mobile apps and online platforms like YouTube, the primary form of digital education came in the form of CD-ROMs, ergo, computer games that were designed to educate children in an interactive manner. Appropriately labeled as edutainment, this area of the gaming market included popular IPs such as Reader Rabbit, Clue Finders, Adiboo, and of course, Humongous Entertainment. However, while I cannot deny that there is certainly educational merit to the numerous titles released by the company, I would not classify most humongous games as edutainment in the traditional sense. Yes, before the days of well-known adventure game developers like Telltale, there was Humongous Entertainment, which just so happened to be a company co-founded by the adventure game programming legend himself, Ron Gilbert. Adventure games may have suffered a decline in popularity over the past 20 years, but back during the early days of computer gaming, they were amongst the most popular genre of games. Monkey Island, Maniac Mansion, Myst, and Loom were all immensely popular titles that garnered critical acclaim, with the former two being games that Ron Gilbert himself helped to develop. At the time, there was no competitor producing adventure games for younger demographics. Ron Gilbert noticed this, and with the establishment of Humongous, he helped to expand this entire genre of video game to a younger generation of individuals so that they too could immerse themselves into the imaginative worlds that adventure games are known for. Unfortunately, at the term of the millennium, the the company began to experience several financial troubles due to the rapid advancement of technology, the ever-changing trends of the gaming market, the children that were once invested in the company growing older, and corporate meddling due to poor decisions made under a new ownership that had a negative impact on the company as a whole. The story of Humongous Entertainment is a tale of hardship and woe, but one that deserves to be told all the same. Over the next 90 minutes, I am going to be providing you with the most comprehensive timeline of Humongous' history that I know to exist on the internet. I have riddled this video with details of significant milestones and achievements that were made by the company during its time in the sun, as well as the eventual downfall that led to where it is today. What started out as a simple video of mine reflecting on the various games I grew up with as a kid quickly transformed into a massive undertaking that I never expected to go as deep as it did. This project consisted of weeks of extensive research, months of planning and revisiting past titles, stumbling across former employees to find out more about their experiences while working for the company, and a whole slew of new discoveries I never would have learned otherwise and cannot wait to share with you. Piecing all of these tidbits of information together led me down a rabbit hole that I never could have imagined would be as deep as it is. As a result, I've put together what I believe to be the most comprehensive and insightful compilation documenting Humongous Entertainment's entire history to the best of my ability, and I hope that this video serves as a gateway for many into the exquisitely charming library of children's point-and-click adventure games produced by the company. This was a very personal project of mine, and is irrefutably the most effort I've ever put into a single video, so I'm hoping that my hard work and effort pays off. Without further ado, I present you the extensively complex history of Humongous Entertainment. And that's when, you know, I kind of thought about, well, maybe I should just make adventure games for kids, you know, and not, you know, not kind of dumbed down storybooks, you know, which, you know, it kind of started to come, come out at that time, but real adventure games with actual puzzles and characters and all those things, but just simplify stuff a little bit. You know, in a, in a normal adventure game, you know, you might solve a puzzle and there might be like four different puzzles that chain together to, you have to do to solve the thing. 
but in the Humongous Entertainment Games, it's like it was only two chains, right? All puzzles were just kind of two steps to solve them. So it was just a little more simplified, but they were real adventure games. And so that's kind of why I decided to do Humongous Entertainment. Humongous Entertainment was originally co-founded between two individual people, Ron Gilbert and Shelley Day. Gilbert, many of whom know most famously for his work on classic adventure games like Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island to even the more recent Thimbleweed Park, has had an exemplary career in the field of game design. In a speech he presented at PAX Australia in 2013, Gilbert cites two particular occurrences during his childhood that spawned his love and passion for game design. The first was an instance when his father, a physics professor who worked at their local university at the time, brought home a TI-59 programmable calculator for his son to mess around with. This introduced Gilbert to the concept of programming through the simple games that were featured on it, as simple as they were. Number guessing games, Battleship, while certainly not the most complex titles ever made, at the time they were enough to ignite the spark that would lead Gilbert down the path that would get him to humongous entertainment. The other inspiration he names is Star Wars. The original Star Wars film was the gateway into opening Gilbert's mind to the idea of the creative process. He cites the film as being the moment when he became fascinated of the process that brought it into existence, stating, Before Star Wars, I didn't know a movie was made and that there were scripts and writing and directing and really, it opened me up to the whole world of the creative process. It was a combination of these two events working together that led Gilbert to want to become a game designer. Originally, he had intended to follow through on a degree in film, but changed his mind during his high school years after becoming more experienced with game design. He names examples of times where he would hack into game ROMs and tamper with the code to change the properties of the way the game functioned in order to learn more about how different variables created new outcomes. Fast forward to about two years into his college degree when Gilbert received a phone call from a gaming company in California. H.E.S.Ware. They were reaching out with a job opportunity to have him move down to their studio and program Commodore 64 games for them full time, leaving him ecstatic of this news, which he happily accepted after a somewhat nerve-wracking but ultimately relieving conversation with his father. Things seemed to be looking up for him, and for a short while, things were going great. But, unfortunately, due to some higher-up trouble, the company he was working for ended up shutting down only six months after he was hired, forcing Gilbert to move back home and pick up where he left off on his college degree. Just a short while later, before he was fully enrolled at his university again, he received a random phone call one day from a representative at Lucasfilm with another job opportunity. As quick as lightning, he accepted the offer, and before he knew it, he was off to California once again to begin producing games for none other than LucasArts. Yes, the LucasArts, although at the time the company was actually known as Lucasfilm Games. It's amusing to think that this man was hired by the very same company that created his original source of inspiration for gaming in the first place, and I can only imagine what he must have felt like coming to this realization. Being given an opportunity to give back and work for the ones responsible for starting your entire career? Oh, it must have been a dream come true for him at the time. He recalls many fond memories in that same speech he gave at PAX Australia 2013, telling the story of how he had met Steven Spielberg for the first time and how their relationship grew as Spielberg would apparently call him up whenever he got stuck playing Monkey Island. This was back before the age of having guides on the internet, so Gilbert recalls having the novelty of talking with Spielberg quickly wearing off after he realized how often he would get stuck. And when he would get stuck in Monkey Island, he would not call the 1-800-HIT line or log into CompuServe. He would just call me. It's like my phone would ring, and I'd hear, hello, this is Diana, I have Steven on the line, he needed some hints for Monkey Island, can I connect you? <laughs> During his time at Lucasfilm, he was given the opportunity to program a wide variety of adventure games, his most notable titles being cult classics like Maniac Mansion, Indiana Jones, and the games that earned his status as a prominent game designer in the industry, Monkey Island 1 and 2. The first two Monkey Island titles are the adventure games that redefined adventure games at the time, with its mix of point-and-click interactivity and wildly immersive world that the player could get lost in. 
Many still hold these titles in high regard and are undeniably considered cult classics by adventure game fans everywhere. I personally hadn't experienced these games before researching this video and I never realized that I was sorely missing out because once I got started on them, I couldn't put them down. Even today they still hold up and I would recommend anyone give them a shot at some point in their lives. While at Lucasfilm, Gilbert also developed the Scum Engine, the prominent game engine that would go on to be used for nearly all humongous entertainment titles over the course of the next decade. Scum, for those who don't know, stands for Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, seeing as that was the game that the engine was originally developed for. Scum was made with capabilities that were primarily aimed at creating the backbone for adventure games specifically, seeing as it supported the verb system and multiple pathways slash actions that could create different outcomes. It was intended to replace the parser-based commands of old adventure games, allow for the development of more complex titles, and make the design process for point-and-click adventures simpler. The engine was created by Gilbert, Brad Taylor, who would later go on to join the Humongous Entertainment team, and Eric Wilmunder, who would stay at LucasArts to contribute to many of its subsequent titles. Following Monkey Island 2, Gilbert began looking at a new opportunity. He wanted to branch off and create his own adventure games under a new company, and after some collaboration with Shelley Day, the two set out to establish what would become Humongous Entertainment on October 30th, 1992. Shelley Day, of course, being the other half that makes up this dynamic duo of children's adventure game publishers. Day was introduced to her first computer game at a barbecue in the early 1980s, a text-based adventure game of some kind that she spent playing for nearly six hours straight, and she immediately went out and bought a Commodore 64 the next day. A few years later, she graduated from the University of San Francisco and went on to work for Electronic Arts being the only female out of 60 producers that worked for the company at the time. A few years later, she joined Accolade and helped produce the original Star Control game. And after that, she went on to work for the newly rebranded LucasArts to produce Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge. This was, of course, where she ended up meeting Gilbert, and following the release of Monkey Island 2, they left the company to establish humongous entertainment together. Gilbert and Day founded the company with assistance from a few separate individuals and entities. According to various reports, the two formed a partnership in the company that would allow each of them to manage different sides of it, with Day taking on the business and financial side of things while Gilbert himself was named chief programmer and game designer for the company. This allowed both of them to play to their strengths, teaching each other about the other's idea of expertise as they fleshed out the company. I've seen conflicting sources on this, with one citing a $300,000 loan while the other cites only $100,000, but the fact of the matter is that the company was assisted by Electronic Arts to get itself off the ground and start producing children's entertainment games under the condition that Electronic Arts would be allowed to publish their titles. Along with Gilbert and Day came a handful of other LucasArts employees that left to start the company with them. Tammy Borowick, Brett Barrett, Chris Sontag, and the aforementioned Brad Taylor. The company began with a staff of six and would eventually grow to roughly 20-something employees by the release of their first game. The origins of the name Humongous Entertainment actually came from the suggestion by Gilbert's colleague at the time, Tim Schafer. The Tim Schafer, who went on to establish Double Fine and create games such as Psychonauts and Brutal Legend, was the one that gave Humongous Entertainment its name. Small world, right? Gilbert states that he chose to name the company Humongous Entertainment rather than Humongous Games because we wanted to remember to be an entertainment company first, even though we only ever made games. According to Tammy Borowick, the name was chosen very consciously. We didn't choose it to be known as a kids' entertainment company. We wanted it to be vague enough that we could move into any form of entertainment as our original plans were to start with kids' games, but to fairly quickly move on to making grown-up games. We also figured we might want to venture outside of computer games at some point. Tim's idea left us a lot of leeway to go wherever we wanted, as long as we were in the business of fun and entertaining products. Little did they realize how successful their children's titles would quickly become. According to Gilbert as well, Humongous Entertainment was not originally created with the intention to produce children's adventure games long term. It was going to just be a regular adventure game company like what he was producing before. In an interview with Night Dive Studios, Gilbert states that his original inspiration for the company came from watching Shelley Day's son play Monkey Island. Shelley was a producer at LucasArts and she co-founded Humongous Entertainment with me. 
Her son was five at the time, and I saw him playing Monkey Island. He couldn't really read yet, so he had no idea what was happening. This was before voice, so there was just a bunch of text flashing on the screen. He would spend hours playing this game, but had no idea what was happening in the story. He just loved walking around in the world, clicking the open verb, and watching the doors open. It was just fascinating. He was probably making up this entire story in his head for what was going on, and it got me thinking, what if I built an adventure game specifically for him? Gilbert figured, if a child can get this immersed into a game without being able to read, just imagine what could be done with a game designed specifically for them. And so, with a stroke of genius, he and his team members set out to begin planning out a lower level adventure game aimed specifically at children using the very same scum engine that he had created for Maniac Mansion while working at LucasArts. The team was already familiar with it thanks to their production of the Monkey Island series, so it seemed like the logical thing to do was keep using it. However, there was some slight difficulty that the company encountered when it was just getting started. As it turns out, Gilbert did not have the rights to the Scum Engine. That was still owned by LucasArts, meaning that he was not actually permitted to use it to create games for Humongous because he did not own a valid license allowing them to do so. However, thanks to some negotiations, he did manage to strike a deal with the company in which he agreed to continue updating and working on the game engine with Brad Taylor and Eric Wilmunder for LucasArts while simultaneously designing games for Humongous. He must have figured, hey, this is a win-win. Humongous gets the license to use the Scum Engine in exchange for continuing to improve his game engine for the games he was already making and simply sharing it with LucasArts in the process. After getting the funds together, acquiring a license for the game engine, hiring a slew of new employees, and settling on the subject for their first game, Humongous was finally ready to get started on its first ever adventure title. Putt Putt joins the parade. The original idea for Putt-Putt came from the mind of none other than Shelley Day herself. She had originally invented the character a few years prior to the game as a made-up bedtime story that she could tell her son Travis before he went to sleep at night. In these stories, Putt-Putt would go on adventures saving cats from trees or adventuring to the moon, the latter of which eventually did become a game. And I assume this to also be the inspiration for how the team ended up taking their approach to games in general. Gilbert, on several occasions, has described their method of designing humongous titles as creating bedtime stories, in the same way that parents will read their kids' stories. They're not reading their kids' math books or books on how to spell, they're reading their kids' nice little stories with morals that the kids can learn something from. Humongous had a goal in mind, to set a new precedent for children's entertainment. With most titles at the time being nothing more than watered-down interactive storybooks or lectures, Humongous saw a prime opportunity for innovation. The company chose to capitalize on this fresh market and came up with ripe new mechanics never really seen before in children's computer software. Ron Gilbert had made a tweet in 2012 stating that one of his original goals in establishing the company was to train an entire generation of children to love adventure games. And if the sheer amount of attention that the nostalgic Reddit posts get every so often are anything to go by, I'd say he succeeded tenfold. And thus, the first entry in the Junior Adventure series came to be. Putt-Putt joins the parade. The game features Putt-Putt going around Car Town collecting various items and completing tasks in order to get everything ready for the local parade being held later that day, employing the point-and-click gameplay in a way that would later go on to become the company's signature style, and features plenty of invigorating challenges that plenty of young minds were eager to explore. In the game, Putt-Putt is required to complete three specific tasks, find a balloon, find a pet, and get a car wash or a new paint job. 
the verb system of Monkey Island has been integrated into Putt-Putt's vehicle dashboard, a very smart visual replacement that still serves the same basic purpose of an inventory system which would later go on to become a staple of Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam, and Spy Fox as well. The game is presented in a cheery tone, but it's not outright condescending towards children. Rather, it presents the players with a situation that allows them to figure it out and solve it themselves. Adventure games are built on the idea of letting the player figure out what to do rather than getting told where to go and which objective to complete the way a lot of modern games tend to. It is also fully voiced by a cast of actors, with a very young Jason Ellefson taking on the lead role as Putt-Putt. Considering that Putt-Putt himself is a kid in the world of Car Town, and that these games were intended to be played by kids, casting a kid as the character just seemed like the smart thing to do and he honestly does a good job most of the time. His performance certainly improved come Putt-Putt 3 and 4. However, when LucasArts caught wind that Humongous had released Putt-Putt Joins the Parade under Electronic Arts, they ended up filing a lawsuit against Humongous for violating the terms of their agreement to the license of the Scum Engine, stating that they broke these terms by allowing EA to publish Putt-Putt Joins the Parade. The agreement that was originally made between both companies stated that Humongous was not allowed to sell a product developed using the SCUM system to any third-party distributors for less than 75% of the six-month rolling average wholesale price at the time. After a three-year period, the price restriction would expire, but I'm honestly not sure if anything came from this lawsuit, seeing as Humongous carried on releasing titles anyways. I just wanted to make a note of it at the very least. Putt-Putt joins the parade hit shelves to a resounding success, and with only one title, Humongous quickly became a developer to watch out for. In its first year, Putt-Putt managed to sell between 65 to 75,000 copies and earned several awards. Family Fun Magazine named it Software of the Year. CD-ROM World ranked it as one of the top 100 CD-ROMs at the time, and CES awarded it with the Innovation Showcase Award in 1994. As of the year 2000, it had sold over 300,000 copies by itself. 1993 was a profitable year for the young studio, with sales continuing to increase tremendously as an estimated 3 to 5 million dollars worth of software was expected to sell in 1994 and double that amount in 1995. The company clearly had a hit on their hands and knew that they were headed in the right direction. For a first time title, this game's reception was likely far greater than the company would have anticipated, and Putt Putt's success quickly led to the immediate development of a sequel in the series, Putt Putt Goes to the Moon, another solid title that seemed to impress people just as much as the first. Of course, developing games for a younger audience had its perks over the adult market, allowing for a more long-term sales projection. Children's software also has a benefit to retailers, according to an article in the Seattle Times from 1994. The programs have longer lifespan as a retail product and offer a longer revenue stream than the adult entertainment software. Although game programs for adults often remain popular only for three to four months or so, software for children can continue to sell well for three to five years. This is likely why Joins the Parade managed to continue selling copies well throughout the entire 1990s decade. Suffice to say, Putt-Putt was a hit amongst both parents and kids alike, and continued to see numerous titles released for him as the years went on. However, Humongous couldn't rely on the success of Putt-Putt alone forever, so next it was time for them to introduce a second IP to the children's entertainment market. Thus came the introduction of Fatty Bear. Fatty Bear is a lesser known IP that only ever saw one mainline game get produced. There is a rumor circulating around the internet that this was because another company owned the rights to the character, but the reality according to the former humongous alumni that created the original character herself, Laurie Bauman Arnold, and again I apologize if I mispronounced that name, was the one who owned the rights to the character, which made the cost of licensing the Fatty Bear character more expensive rather than just coming up with new characters that the company Company would have full ownership of. Laurie actually shared this image of the original Fatty Bear on Venice Beach sometime several decades ago on the official Humongous Entertainment alumni Facebook group, which has been one of the best sources of information that I have used for the making of this video. According to her, the bear still exists to this day, currently resting in an apartment somewhere in Chicago. 
Alas, Fatty Bear never caught on as much as Putt-Putt did, both in terms of sales and just the general name of the character. Obviously, the term fatty can come across as a derogatory insult, and thus it made it difficult to market the character when such a negative connotation was attached to the name. Humongous was still up and coming at this point in its history, though, and couldn't afford to take such a drastic risk on a character like this, and they were still looking to prove they weren't a one-trick pony. Putt-Putt had two titles by this point, and there were no other games that were matching its strides, so it was time for a new title to take over the spotlight and get up on store shelves. After several ideas had been pitched around the company, it was ultimately settled that an undersea detective named Freddy Fish was next up to bat. Sam. Sure thing, Freddy. They're wonderful. Gotta go, Sam. Oh, bye, Freddy. Whoa! I have a very soft spot for Freddy Fish in the case of the missing kelp seeds. It's certainly shown its age in comparison to later entries in the series, but in my humble opinion, this game still holds up today. Now, I'll just put it out there that I'm a bit partial to Freddy Fish 1, not only for it being my first ever humongous entertainment game, but for being my first ever video game in general. Before Sonic, Pokemon, Kirby, Assassin's Creed, Saints Row, and all the other famous gaming IPs out there that I'm a diehard hard fan of, there was Freddy Fish. Freddy Fish 1 is a particularly noteworthy title in the history of Humongous because it marks what would become the biggest shift in game development that the company ever faced. Adapting from its old digital graphic art in MS-DOS to the revolutionary new hand-drawn method that the company later became so well known for. In the first two Putt-Putt games, as well as Fatty Bear, all of the graphics and artwork were done by building these animated sprites via pixels. The process was done entirely digitally, with the characters and backgrounds being designed, colored, and animated, wholly on a computer. And I mean no offense when I say this, but it certainly shows. The backgrounds are lacking in a high level of detail, the characters look very jagged, and something just seems off about Putt-Putt's character sprites. Compare this by taking a look at Freddy Fish, and you'll notice that the graphics and images on screen appear to be cleaner, crisper, and far more detailed. This was all a result of the artistic side of the game's development getting shifted to a new method of visual presentation, hand-drawn animation. I suppose my use of the term new is relative here, because hand-drawn animation had been around for decades by this point in time. But in terms of integrating these techniques into software and video games, this was only just starting to become a possibility. Looking at earlier adventure games like Putt-Putt and Monkey Island, as well as games on the NES and Super Nintendo, it becomes clear that almost every game that was ever released was created using digital pixels. With Freddy Fish, however, there was a new process to creating character animation. First, every frame of a character in a particular scene or performing a particular action had their outlines hand-drawn in an uncolored format by hand on a sheet of paper by the staff's animators. These drawings were then scanned into a computer by the production assistants and then digitally cleaned up by the ink and painters after the fact. Outlines, coloring, and shadows were all touched up by these individuals and performed after the line art was completed, allowing for the smoother and more visually pleasing aesthetic that put humongous games ahead of the crowd at the time. A game like Cuphead, which released in 2017, was made using similar methods in order to get its animation as smooth and striking as it is, which really goes to show how much untapped potential there still appears to be within this method of graphical presentation in the video game industry. Humongous' shift in animation occurred as a result of an inspiration and fear that creative director Ron Gilbert faced when he attended a conference of some kind being hosted by a rival software company that was showing off their new method of scanning in hand-drawn animations for a game that they were working on at the time. Gilbert describes the experience of viewing these new images as stunning. 
He could tell that they were still made of pixels, but these were sexy pixels. The experience completely changed how he had viewed their approach to games, and when he returned to the company's office the next day, he gathered up all of the artists and designers on staff to ask them if they would be able to pull off the same thing. Despite having minimal experience in hand-drawn animation, the crew knew that they were up to the task, and they had agreed to completely scrap everything that they had worked on up until that point in order to make this change a reality. All of the character sprites, backgrounds, inventory items, everything, thrown away in an instant as the team started back at square one. At the very least, the game still kept its overall structure, design, script, and storyline, so not everything was eliminated from production, but the game's entire visuals department needed to be completely redone from the ground up. And considering the game still retained the same shipping date without any delay getting ordered, this meant the game's artists now had half the time to create all of the visual assets for a full game using a new method of animation they had never performed before. Many former employees described their experiences, saying they had to work extra unpaid overtime just to get the game finished and released on time, and under most circumstances this would not motivate anyone to keep working on the game. But for the humongous employees in particular, this was more than just a job to them. This was a passion. It's truly incredible that this team was capable of producing true works of art, given that all of the stressors that were constantly putting pressure on them, on top of being a relatively small dev team. Shelley Day, despite being in charge of the company's financials, also took on several other responsibilities, acquiring printers to rent for the building, communicating with landlords regarding the maintenance, signing paychecks, etc, etc. Many former employees would work numerous overtime hours on these games to make them as perfect as possible, going so far as to essentially make the company their home. Luckily, the staff was super supportive in maintaining a very relaxed environment, with the dress code primarily consisting of shorts, t-shirts, and sandals. This was likely why the company had such a low employee turnover rate. Just based on the stories that I've read from these former alumni, Humongous really comes across to me more like a family than a company. Yeah, they made games in order to turn a profit, sure, but they weren't no greedy corporate entity. They were a truly remarkable team of individuals aiming to make something fantastic. Something interesting about Freddy Fish in particular is that the graphics weren't the only aspect to receive an overhaul. The actual design of many of the game's characters were drastically changed as well. In the original MS-DOS version of Freddy Fish 1, Freddy was a more peach-colored fish with purple fins rather than the orange and yellow goldfish that she's now come to be. Luther also appears to have gone through a massive change, and many of the backgrounds were repositioned as well. Although, many of them are still recognizable, such as the caves guarded by Eddie the Eel or the King's Throne Room, or the cave that Gabby is trapped in. Personally, I much prefer the final designs to the DOS version of the game, but it's still interesting to see what the game could have turned out to be had the company not decided to change course from the direction that the final game was heading in. According to Tammy Borowick, the team had to hire an actual animator at the time named Louis Scarborough who taught the crew how to use ink and paints so that they could concentrate on the new animation techniques that they needed to use for Freddy Fish 1. Backgrounds for the game were also required to increase in resolution and change aspect ratio due to the new technology on the rise, which explains why many of them were updated or repositioned in the final game. Even the scum code needed to be completely reworked to accommodate the new, larger backgrounds and animation of characters. The music also saw a massive improvement, going from the more chiptune sounding MIDI files to recorded audio with real instruments. Freddy Fish 1's soundtrack in particular stands out to me as one of the best in the entire company's library. During development, the company's staff grew to upwards of 60 employees including a slew of new animators that were hired purely to create click point animations for the game and nothing else. Stick a pin in that idea, by the way, we'll be coming back to those later. One aspect of the game and future titles that I've noticed is that some players seem to be distracted by the lack of lip syncing. What's wrong, Grandma Grouper? Someone took my treasure chest. Grandma, your treasure chest that holds all the kelp seeds. This was very much noticed by the developers, and due to the labor-intensive restrictions of the time, was not made to be as precise as possible on purpose. According to one employee, he describes it as very labor-intensive because all of the dialogue had to be hand-scripted with the appropriate mouth animations for all the sounds that make up each word. 
I tried automating the process once and fell into the uncanny valley of close, but far enough away for your brain to notice it was wrong. Random mouth movements actually look better because your brain ignores the lack of patterns instead of trying to make sense of it. Now, you have to bear in mind that in the early 90s, having fully voice acted characters in a computer game posed quite the challenge. Between emerging technologies in audio engineering to the limited disk space, memory management, and the aforementioned animation challenge, it was clear that this was no easy task. This is why lip syncing was not as much of a priority as actually getting the dialogue into the game in the first place. The image on screen is an example of one of these sheets that displays all of Luther's mouth movements that correspond to the sounds that they mimic. This would serve as a guide to get the general lip positions across, but as confirmed by these employees, the characters were never fully synced. Considering the limitations at the time, I easily give this a pass. It also didn't help that Windows 95 was hot off the presses at the time, with Freddy Fish 1 actually being one of the games that Microsoft was marketing as being compatible with the brand new operating system. Of course, this ended up being a benefit in the long run, seeing as Microsoft's advertising got a lot of eyes on Humongous that had previously never heard of them before. The team had to reconfigure the Scum engine to work properly with the new system and integrate WinG and DirectX support on top of that. Under most circumstances, it would seem that a project like this was doomed to fail. But with a team as tight-knit and positive-minded as Humongous, anything was possible, and after months of working overtime and possibly several sleepless nights, the crew still managed to pull it off. Freddy Fish in the case of the missing kelp seeds was released on October 28, 1994 and rapidly amassed critical acclaim. Electronic Entertainment named it 1994's best edutainment title, citing that the game features wonderful original characters, a strong storyline, appropriately challenging puzzles, and beautiful animation. Freddy also earned the Editor's Choice Award from Newsweek magazine and accrued many, many more over the next several years. In its first year alone, the game sold over 50,000 copies, and by 2001, that number had grown to over 350,000 copies, thus proving the extended shelf life that children's edutainment titles were lucky to maintain. Humongous had done it, Freddy Fish was a hit, and they found their stride that would help them climb the ranks of the children's software industry and rise above the rest as one of the greats. Good morning, Mr. Baldini. Today's the opening of the Car Town Zoo. I know, but, but it's a bigger day. How would you and a pepper like to take some zoo chow over there before they open? Would we ever, Mr. Baldini? <laughs> By the end of 1994, Humongous Entertainment had clearly gotten their name on the map. They had proven with both Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish that it was entirely possible to create adventure games aimed at children with the ability to immerse them into the worlds and stories that they were being told. While nearly all other children's software companies were prioritizing the educational half of edutainment, Humongous was fixated on the entertainment aspect, and that clearly proved to be the correct approach to take. Putt-Putt and Freddy succeed where other characters fail because they are well thought out main characters to engage children in a positive manner, give kids a terrific experience they can benefit from and capture their heart at the same time. Most edutainment titles don't feature iconic characters, but rather just boring filler animals. Not humongous though, they create genuine characters. According to a newspaper article from the Seattle Times in 1995, other software companies at the time claimed that they had no idea why some characters were hits, but it's really not that difficult. They just need a personality and to be given a set of goals and morals that they live by. They need to be a positive role model. Treat the character as though they were a real person rather than a bunch of pixels or drawings on a screen, and encourage the player to want to help the character. A good character in children's software needs to be a living being, and you need to know where it's been and why it is. Characters who begin this way seem to be more alive. Before our new program even began to be developed, I spent a couple of months thinking about Freddy Fish as I was driving to work. Who would Freddy's friends be? What would Freddy do? Ron Gilbert, 1995. Humongous had a keen attention to detail, taking in all sorts of factors when crafting these games. One problem they constantly found themselves needing to overcome was finding reasons for the characters in the games to pick up items without outright stealing them, so as not to encourage that sort of behavior. This shovel might come in handy. I think I'll borrow it.
When asked about this, Ron Gilbert responded with, That was a big issue, because we did not want kids to learn this kind of thing. Because adventure games are really about kleptomania, so there always had to be reasons that had to make some kind of sense to the kids. So, an item would just sit around, and the kids would try and pick it up, so their character would ask, Can I borrow this? And the other character would agree, or ask for a favor in return. As it just so happened, the children's software market appears to have exploded in 95 as Humongous Entertainment began to see a dramatic increase in sales over the course of the year. Humongous themselves saw sales figures jump to over $10 million for the year, more than double the amount from 1994. However, it wasn't just Humongous that witnessed an increase in demand. The entire children's software industry in general began to experience a rapid uprise in popularity, seeing as the CD-ROMs produced for the market nearly doubled between 1994 and 1995 alone. Likely due to more and more people continuing to purchase personal computers for their homes now that the technology was readily available. According to another Seattle Times article, an editor of Children's Software Review at the time named Warren Buckleitner was aware of over over 1,550 individual children's software titles currently for sale. At this point, it became a game of quality over quantity to rise to the top, and luckily Humongous was already on the right track. Their team of 62 employees stood out amongst the noise of other companies that were putting out half-hearted attempts at educating children through their endearing characters and plentiful storytelling abilities. While the market may have been dominated by other companies such as Disney Interactive, The Learning Company, and Broderbund, Humongous was certainly on the rise and a producer to look out for in the coming years. In 1995, Humongous saw the release of Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo and the Let's Explore series, the latter of which saw its first title, Let's Explore the Farm, released in October of 1994, but it was updated and re-released in July of 95 alongside Let's Explore the Airport. Finally, Let's Explore the Jungle was released in November of that year. Seeing as Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo was my first ever Putt-Putt title, I find that it'll serve as a good backdrop for the next few highlights I want to mention that made Humongous Entertainment games so appealing to its audience, namely, click points. Ah, that's right, we're removing that pin we stuck in earlier and bringing it up now. Click points are these nifty little animations that play whenever the player clicks on a particular object on screen. Besides having the ability to click on the edges of the screen to determine which room to move to and selecting items from your inventory, Humongous games give the player the ability to interact with all sorts of different background objects and locations that all play a nifty and amusing little animation when you click on them. Sometimes they're related to the environment around them, and other times they are just completely random and silly little gags. But. From my perspective, click points are genius inclusions in the game that not only incline children to explore their surroundings and experiment with different objects to discover new outcomes, but it rewards their curiosity with a new surprise, joke, or discovery that can allow them to learn different skills without even realizing it. Gilbert, in another interview, trust me, he's done a lot of these things, explained that the origin for the idea of click points came when he noticed the kids were more interested in just goofing around in the game, whereas adults are more interested in solving a game. One of the things Humongous Entertainment had were what we called click points, which you would click and they would just do funny animations. They didn't have anything to do with the puzzles, they were just fun. We added those because kids like goofing around in the game. These click points make for a brilliant way to get kids to ask questions and encourage them to think outside the box. I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but one of my all-time favorite click points appears in Putt-Putt Travels Through Time. In the medieval area, there are these two plants located at the entrance of the time vortex. The one on the right spits out a tiny seed that falls down in an arc, while the left plant has a bird rise up and open his mouth to yawn. Six-year-old me thought to try and time it so that the seed would land in the bird's mouth right as he was yawning. And lo and behold, when I did that, an entirely new animation played showing the bird celebrating for catching the seed. In that moment, I felt like a genius for combining those two animations together, and it indirectly taught me about the concept of cause and effect. It's little things like that that go a long way and provide the game with even more depth than it already has. It fills the player with a sense of, well, now I gotta try and see how many cool little animations I can find. The best aspect of these animations is that they have so much versatility. Some of them play in isolated animations, some of them have different variations of the same idea, some can be combined with other animations to create an entirely new outcome, some can change the actual environment such as this billboard that teases both Freddy Fish and Fatty Bear after taking on a weight loss program, and on the rare occasion, a click point will end up taking you to a full-on song. 
We are the topiary creatures. We're very pleased to meet you, senors and senoritas, too. Topiary Creatures is probably the most iconic song of all humongous games. This one's still just as catchy and memorable today as it was when the game came out, and that's a bonus of most humongous games in general. After Freddy Fish 1 and the switch to hand-drawn animation, the games became much more timeless and long-lasting. Certainly, you can still notice hints of outdated technology in aspects like the audio compression and lip-syncing as mentioned earlier, but on the whole, they still hold up remarkably well. The visual style of the game Games is very much akin to cartoons of the time, especially with the thicker outlines and clever use of squash and stretch. One aspect that I absolutely love about Putt-Putt's character is that the animators gave him the ability to twist his body around in ways that a standard car would not be capable of. If he were animated like a real-life automobile, he would be a far less expressive character, being limited to only facial animations and lacking that body language that conveys so much additional reactionary emotion. Personality carries these games to far greater heights, and Humongous knew their formula by the time Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo rolled around. Ron Gilbert even considers Saves the Zoo to be the game where everything came together and the team really understood what they were making. Funnily enough, Gilbert also made a tweet saying that Putt-Putt Golf sued them because of the name of the character, and part of the settlement was that they never have to make a golf game involving Putt-Putt. Probably also explains why they never made a backyard golf. And I totally believe this, because I remember whenever I would bring up Putt-Putt to a kid that didn't know who Putt-Putt was, they would always think I was talking about mini golf. Oh, those poor kids. They had no idea what they were missing. With the release of Saves the Zoo, it was yet another financial success, and the game was named the best kids CD-ROM game on shelves today by Newsweek Magazine in 1995. The Let's Explore series, on the other hand, was a trilogy of games made in conjunction with Random House, the original publisher of these games. They were far less story-driven compared to the adventures with Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish. Rather, these titles were designed more as explorable environments that had a more direct focus on educating kids about their respective settings. In Let's Explore the Airport, for example, which is the game I'm most familiar with, there's an entire index that lists all of the different parts of a plane and an airport, and it explains how the process of getting on a flight works. You can visit locations like the terminal, car rental, baggage check-ins and sorting, and so on. There's honestly a lot of different rooms to explore, and while I don't know that this would be vital information for a child to learn about, it is something cool that could be catered towards those with a specific interest in aviation, or farm life, or the jungle. Even still, the game is plentiful with click points, and while I may not have owned any of these titles as a kid, I distinctly remember the Let's Explore the Airport demo coming with many of the other games I've owned, and let me tell you what, I've seen this fish ignite like a rocket more times than I can count. Uh -oh. Seriously, that was like the funniest thing to me at a young age. I, I loved it. 1995 proved successful for Humongous, and 1996 seemed to be looking like things were getting even better. The company brought in over $10 million in 95 and grew to roughly 92 employees by the end of the year, over triple the initial amount the company had started at when it released Putt-Putt Joins the Parade. However, as the market continued to rapidly expand, it became clear that Humongous, while successful, was still an incredibly small company that was being overshadowed by the other big names like Disney and Sierra. Early in the year, Jonathan Miller wrote a newspaper article for the Journal American, a local paper near Seattle, Washington. By the way, that's where the company was based, I probably should have mentioned that earlier in the video, about Humongous's hopes for the upcoming year. In the article, the managing director of EA Seattle at the time, Ivan Manley gave his two cents on Humongous's status relative to other edutainment companies. I think a company like Humongous over the long term is going to have to become part of a larger company because they're not going to be able to get their product out there, even if it's a great product. Oh, Ivan, if you only knew that that would lead to the company's demise. Shelly Day, on the other hand, was pretty opposed to the idea, claiming that there were no plans for an acquisition whatsoever. Gilbert backed up this idea by mentioning that they had created the company so that they could run things the way they wanted to, rather than filling in niche markets. 
Day further cements this point by calling attention to what sets Humongous apart from other companies that has allowed them to garner so much success and stay afloat. That being that they focus on the play side of childhood compared to other companies which seem to gravitate towards the hard education. Humongous continued to rise up and with a new year came new potential for brand new games to sweep the market. Little did Humongous realize that this would be the year they release what would become their most popular junior adventure series to date. Pajama Sam is a blue-tinted boy who dresses like his superhero role model, Pajama Man, to take down the nefarious evildoers that seem to be causing trouble for him in his everyday life. The character was originally created by none other than Ron Gilbert himself, although his original concept shows that he was actually supposed to be named Pumpkinhead Boy, who is essentially a boy with a pumpkin for a head. Personally, I think Pajama Sam rolls off the tongue better. When I first started to think of him, he was actually called the Pumpkinhead Boy and he wasn't necessarily in pajamas. He had nothing to do with Halloween, he just had a pumpkin for a head. And about a month into doing the concepts for that, our head of marketing came to us and he said, we can't do the pumpkin head boy game because everyone will think of it as a seasonal game and it will only sell at Halloween. And at first I thought, that's stupid, don't tell me what to do creatively. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized he was totally right. I could have continued to do it as the pumpkin head boy, but I think it would have impacted that game a lot because people would have thought of it as a Halloween game. So we brought the whole team together and started brainstorming different names. And Rafael Colonzo Jr., who did the art for it, started cranking out a lot of stuff. And Pajama Sam came out of that. Based on everything I could find, Pajama Sam was first publicly announced at none other than the Electronic Entertainment Expo, or as many people probably know it as, E3, in June of 1996. The title being shown off was none other than Pajama Sam in No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside, a game set in the land of darkness where Sam can experience plenty of unique puzzles and challenges whilst making friends with a wide assortment of characters along the way. King, Otto, Carrot, each one of them serve a purpose and help Sam navigate the land in order to put a stop to darkness. The genius of Pajama Sam is that the games take a concept that kids tend to be afraid of, whether it be the dark, thunderstorms, or healthy foods, and turns that idea into an entire game that indirectly shows these children with these fears that they aren't really things to be afraid of. By personifying concepts like darkness and thunder and lightning, it allows kids to become more acclimated to them because they're seeing them as characters rather than just some physical concept that's haunting them at night. And no need to hide, Sam is on a quest to vanquish darkness from his closet so that he'll be able to fall asleep comfortably, and with the help of his trusty flashlight, mask, and villain containment unit, he's ready to take him down once and for all. Of course, Sam doesn't get too far in the game before he gets stopped by a group of nasty trees that steal his items, preventing him from taking on darkness just yet and forcing him to navigate around the land in order to get those items back. Typical adventure game fare. Humongous Entertainment also released a series of spin-off games known as the Junior Arcade series. These were titles like Cheese Chase, Lost and Found, and Water Worries. I personally was never really a fan of these sorts of games, but I do see how they could hold some merit to other types of individuals. These essentially played like classic arcade titles where you were presented with one style of gameplay and a slew of levels that got more challenging as you progressed through the game. They were a nice side distraction for sure, but definitely felt like they did not have the same budget as a main adventure title. During this expo, many of the humongous employees that worked on the game were interviewed about their upcoming title, describing it as an immersive, wacky world with original music and more than 50 unique locations for kids to play in and explore, said by Rich Moe, lead programmer on the game. He goes on to explain that children will have fun exploring, discovering, and directing Pajama Sam's adventure. Families will love playing the game 
game again and again because it changes every time they play. Whole new environments become unlocked, and the items needed to solve the game are different each time. And I want to elaborate on that point. This is another attribute of humongous games that give them such an advantage over other competitors' titles. Replayability. Certainly, other titles before this, such as The Case of the Missing Kelp Seeds, had this same concept, but I find the Pajama Sam 1 is a better example to use to discuss it because this is where the player's freedom flourished. Humongous Entertainment almost always encourages replayability in their games. The click points, which I discussed alongside Pup Putt Saves the Zoo, are just one example of this, but an even greater example is the fact that each of Sam's items have two possible locations that they can spawn in. His flashlight could be in this storage shed next to the waterfall, or it could be located deep within the mines. Sam's lunchbox might be sunken deep underwater in a dark cave, or it could just be sitting next to a wishing well that doesn't want to give it back. And of course, Sam's mask is either in the possession of a carrot who wants to save his brethren from Darkness's fridge, or trapped underneath the leg of dancing furniture. <laughs> like my pajama Sam mask. The items are randomized every time the player starts a new playthrough, meaning that there are 12 different combinations of item locations that a player could experience with this game. This same trend continues in the sequels to this franchise, although in those games you're actually able to select the locations of the items you need if you go into the options menu. Unlike this game where it's randomly generated by the game when you start it up. Freddy Fish 2, which released just one month after this game, also had a similar structure where the player would have to collect five randomly determined items out of eight possibilities, and almost every humongous title after these would continue to promote multiple playthroughs. Almost all of them. According to the source that hosted that interview from E3 1996, Pajama Sam No Need to Hide hit store shelves at $40, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the most any humongous game ever sold for. Most titles I've noticed sold for between 20 to 30 bucks, so either the company knew they could afford to price the game so high, or this source is just plain incorrect. Other sources tell me that the game was priced at $50, so I'm not getting a consistent answer on this, but all of these are definitely indicating that it costs more than any other humongous game ever released at the time. And understandably so. The game did feature those multiple pathways as I had mentioned, which all previous humongous titles did not have, at least to its extent. See, all three Putt-Putt titles that were released had you traversing one singular path every time you played the game. Sure, you could go after each objective in whatever order you want, but they were all always in the same locations. And in the case of Freddy Fish, the bottles you needed to find were randomized in groups, i.e. the first bottle could be in one of three locations, the second could be in one of two, and the third could be in one of two, but they did not overlap, and you could only always find one at a time. This meant that after finding the first bottle, you would always have to go to the beach or the trench second, and then the king's castle or one of the three caves last every time. It was slightly less repetitive, but it was still linear because it did not give players the freedom to get items in any order they wish. No Need to Hide was the first humongous game to give the player the freedom to tackle the items in any order and have multiple locations for them to spawn, with Freddy Fish 2 kind of following suit but also implementing a different method of item collection. Proving that Humongous was continuing to improve their products with every new release as they continued to break the mold. However, despite these advancements in game design, a rather shocking event had occurred just one month before Pajama Sam's release. On July 11th, 1996, it was announced that Humongous Entertainment had been purchased by GT Interactive for $76 million. Just a few short months after that other newspaper article was written regarding the company not wanting to accept any deals to be bought out by somebody else, the company agreed to being bought out by somebody else. I'm not sure what changed in the mindset of those that made this decision, but clearly there must have been some sort of incentive at play, and I hope it was more than just the money. According to this newspaper, 
the agreement was made between both parties with the intent of increasing Humongous' sales through a broader distribution, as its alliance would allow for the products to be put in more stores. I assume that despite GT getting a cut of the revenue, the estimated sales figure increase would still be far greater than the revenue Humongous was currently receiving. But I still find it interesting because that article from earlier in the year showed that the company was projecting to double its sales again in 1996 anyways. So was this decision made really about the money? I want to give it the benefit of the doubt, but it just seems so odd to me that there would be such a quick turnaround for this. Knowing what I know now and what I will explain as we continue on in the video, I wish that this decision was never made. But first, I suppose I should provide some context for who exactly GT Interactive was at the time seeing as they were a pretty big video game publisher during the 1990s. The company was founded in 1993 and published their very first title in the same year. The original Doom. Yeah, that's right. My choice of playing E1M1 was not just for the dramatic effect. Doom is a game that anyone with a knowledge of gaming history knows to have received widespread critical acclaim, amassed massive success, established an entirely new genre of video game alongside Wolfenstein, and became a long-running franchise that has still continued seeing new games get released to this day. Doom's popularity is in part thanks to it being originally released as a shareware title, a game which costs nothing to play, but it only allowed players to access the first level. After that, the game needed to be purchased in order to continue playing, kind of like a demo essentially. Luckily, because GT wasn't the worst publisher in the world, they actually allowed id Software to keep the rights to their own IP, a very uncommon practice in the industry, but I still respect it nonetheless. They later went on to release other successful titles like Doom 2 and Mortal Kombat 3. In its first year, GT grossed $10.3 million. In 1994, it grossed $101 million, with an increase in revenue of 880% and profits of $18 million, with Doom 2 selling 2 million copies by itself. Back then, that was more than just a massive success. That was legendary. In 1995, the company made a deal with Walmart to be its sole exclusive software provider, meaning that any other developer out there needed to go through GT in order to sell their games at the largest store chain in the country. And in 1996, the company did the exact same thing with Target, too. That should bring us up to speed with where GT Interactive was at the time of the humongous purchase. GT had also acquired Wizardworks, Formgen, and the European division of Time Warner Interactive as well during the same year. Sales had increased roughly 130% in 1996, so at this time things still seemed to be looking good for the company. Thankfully, with the purchase of Humongous, GT Interactive was able to put marketing dollars behind their products, but also philosophically believed that companies like Humongous should remain independent. This meant minimal interference from the parent company, which was great news for Humongous because they could continue working on games just as they had previously. Gilbert and Day even stayed at the company heading the projects as if nothing had ever changed. From the sound of things, it seemed as if things were going to remain the same. Unfortunately, the status quo was about to change. Even with the purchase by GT Interactive, 1996 was still a successful year for the company, with its sales increasing from 10 to 15 million. However, 1997 ended up being arguably the most ambitious year that Humongous Entertainment ever had. There were a lot of new projects popping up and plenty of announcements for extended merchandising of the already established Humongous brands. You could almost say their ambition was humongous. Ah. Sorry, had to make a joke like that at least once in this video. The most prominent announcement, if you ask me, was made in March of that year. According to multiple sources, the company was in talks with a few studios about getting either a movie or an animated television series made using Humongous's trademark characters. According to the Los Angeles Times, the plan was to create a TV show patterned on Warner Brothers' hour-long Looney Tunes shows, which features a series of short segments starring different characters. Would this have consisted of just characters 
characters from the games that were made, or when new exclusive characters have been introduced for the TV series. This never ended up coming to fruition, which is why I'm speculating here. At the time though, it seemed like a brilliant idea. Noel Resnick, Senior Vice President of Program Development for the company Lancet, went on record stating, This is the first time millions of kids have created strong bonds with a family of characters before they debut on TV, video, or the big screen. Analysts agree Humongous' deal will help the firm remain viable in a crowded children's educational software market, where more than 650 competitors jostled for name recognition last year. The overall home education software segment brought in more than $568 million in sales for the first nine months of 1996, according to the Software Publishers Association. This deal was made in coordination with Lancet Media Entertainment, the company known for the popular hit PBS series Reading Rainbow. So this honestly seemed like a match made in heaven. Based on the March announcements, the television show was expected to launch in the fall of 1998. But for one reason or another, the series unfortunately didn't get picked up. Supposedly the show was named Putt-Putt and Friends and was pitched to PBS, but they weren't interested in it at the time, which shocks and amazes me personally given the overlap in demographics there, not to mention the popularity. According to John M, because I don't want to butcher that last name, a former Humongous employee, there was a pilot made for a Pajama Sam TV series at one point that also got canned, and for good reason. He describes it as, Sam's design was changed and was older. I still think dressed in the same preschooler pajamas. They gave him a generic neighborhood bully as a nemesis. It had absolutely none of the charm or fun of the games, but it looked like it had cost a lot. I tell you, these canned humongous shows would make for a great lost media video. Around the same time that year, Humongous also announced plans for the opening of another development team as an offshoot of the main branch, Cave Dog Entertainment, a team set to be led by Ron Gilbert with plans to produce three titles a year aimed at an older audience, starting with their first game, Total Annihilation, in the fourth quarter of 1997. Total Annihilation was a top-down strategy game released later that year and received widespread critical acclaim, selling over one million copies. With all of these deals and new announcements, announcements being made, it seemed like the agreement for GT to buy them out ended up being beneficial after all. Just one year under the new company and Humongous already had increased its sales again from 15 million to over 20 million dollars with no signs of stopping. By this time, many other children's software companies were starting to drop out of the race or get swooped up and dissolved or merged into bigger titans like Disney and The Learning Company, but Humongous was still going strong. In fact, they were doing so well that they were recognized as one of the top five children's software producers at the time, according to an article from Biz Journals. The article also reassures that the fast growth confirms GT Interactive's wisdom in not fiddling with Humongous' talented creative team or the way it does business. Instead, GT Interactive has given the company free reign, adding its financial support and the distribution muscle to get Humongous products on the shelves of Walmart and Target stores, among other mass retailers. There's a quote in this article in which Humongous executives talked of television shows, toys, and a brand name that is going to be around in 25 years. Yeah, that could have aged better. As of July 1997, when this article was written, it is noted that more than 200 employees were working at Humongous by this point, a gargantuan increase from the initial six that had started the company back in 1992. And that increase in employee numbers shows with the sheer amount of titles that were announced at E3 that year. A new junior sports series, starting with a baseball game that featured a cast of 30 kids who essentially serve as neighborhood sports buddies, a new product line called Big Thinkers that that offers the skill-based focus of traditional educational software, but with the assistance of an entertaining pair of twin characters named Ben and Becky Brightly, and a new character named Spy Fox, a sort of furry James Bond whose detective work is the latest addition to Humongous's Junior Adventure series, according to the LA Times. Brad Carlton described these game announcements as titles that were growing up with the kids that were playing Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish just a few years prior. Two of these titles would go on to become successful, but the third ended up underperforming. From my perspective, Big Thinkers is the most edutaining game Humongous ever produced, although I can see some arguments being made for the Let's Explore series. Big Thinkers had two titles released under its brand, Kindergarten and First Grade. As the subtitles imply, these were games aimed at a specific age of kids with the goals of teaching them skills under the guise of various mini-games. They don't get as in your face as something like Reader Rabbit, but I can see why these titles were not as appealing as the typical adventure fair consumers had come to expect from the company by this point. 
This, along with the fact that the games were singling out one particular age group, ended up causing their market to shrink because it gave off the impression that kids who weren't entering kindergarten yet, and kids who had already graduated from it, shouldn't be playing it because, well, they weren't in kindergarten. I know for a fact that when I was a kid and I saw a game that was targeted at a level above or below me, I didn't want to play it because I felt like I wasn't supposed to. I don't think these are necessarily bad games, but of all of Humongous' franchises, this is definitely the least appealing to me for sure. Warren Buckleitner, who I mentioned earlier, went on record stating, If big thinkers had come out a year earlier, they probably would have been a runaway success. The games had some breakthrough concepts, but they were trying to break new ground at a time when there was a lot of competition. Warren still gave the series a 4.5 out of 5 stars. I don't know that I necessarily agree with him, but I respect that he gave the series so much praise. Spy Fox, on the other hand, was yet another success and took his place at the pedestal amongst the other three junior adventure game IPs. Spy Fox is a suave James Bond parody character tasked with taking down nefarious supervillains who plan to take over the world in one way or another. In his first title, Dry Cereal, Spy Fox must stop the evil Billy the Kid from stealing the whole world's milk supply and replacing cow milk with goat milk, allowing him to become rich while simultaneously destroying the cow milk industry. Industry. The game plays like all other junior adventure titles, with the point-and-click gameplay that fans of Humongous are all too familiar with. The origins of the character came from an idea that Brad Carlton and Brett Barrett had fleshed out together while going to the gym one day. Brad recalls that because they both loved spy stuff, it'd be a perfect fit for a game. He started as Sly Fox, but that name was taken, so at the suggestion of one of our marketing people, we simply changed the name to Spy Fox. He was also largely inspired by the TV series Get Smart. One of the shining factors that make Spy Fox so appealing is its intelligent writing, chock full of ingenious puns and catchphrases that totally went over my head as a child, but as an adult, I get a kick out of. So what do you think of Skycorp's new Greek Island Mobile Command Center? Impressive. Disguising it as a half-buried boat in the middle of the town square was a stroke of genius. Nobody would ever notice that. So by this point, we've already discussed the gameplay, art and animation, and replayability aspects with the previous three junior adventure titles. But what else is left for me to discuss using Spy Fox as a backdrop? <laughs> The laser toothbrush makes impervious steel doors pervious. Ah, yes, the music. Don't get me wrong, all humongous games have iconic music that got stuck in my head for years. There was, of course, already the previously mentioned topiary creatures, Pajama Sam's theme is iconic, and the Case of the Missing Kelp Seeds opener is a legendary piece of music through and through. But Spy Fox has his own recognizable theme too. Of all aspects for the Spy Fox series to really pay attention to, the music, soundtrack, and of course the writing seem to have been made the biggest focus of these titles, even more so than previous humongous games. Dry Cereal takes place on the island of Acidophilus, a fictional island located located somewhere off the coast of Greece. All Spy Fox games are also known for their inclusion of various geographical locations around the globe. Seeing as a lot of James Bond movies take place in various countries, it makes sense that these games would see Spy Fox traveling around as well. The soundtrack of Dry Serial consists of two primary instruments, the piano and the synthesizer. Practically every song in this game uses at least one, if not both of these instruments, and they come together so well. Dry Serial hands down has my favorite soundtrack of the entire company, and without question deserves more love and attention because there are some masterful compositions contained within this game. And of course, the writing. Don't even get me started on the writing. The sheer level of genius that went into writing jokes that adults would totally love that would go over kids' heads are jaw-dropping. Seriously, if you're an adult and haven't played this game in recent times, go back and give it a shot because the sheer number of jokes that they crack are absolutely absurd. Definitely gives the game and the character a lot more wit. And then of course, there's Backyard Sports. I mean, what is there to say? The Junior Sports series is unquestionably Humongous' most successful IP of all time. 
Pablo Sanchez is the greatest athlete to ever live, and the sheer levels of representation prevalent in this game is absolutely groundbreaking for the entire video game industry. We did not just create characters and give them real sports star names, says Elizabeth Stringer, director of development sports. When playing the backyard sports games, children are as picky as they are in real life, and they will choose the backyard children that they best relate to. Same goes with the professional children, so we went to those sports stars and asked them their favorite colors, foods, music, and other things that children relate to. Backyard sports was ahead of its time. You've got all sorts of people with different backgrounds, interests, talents. Practically any kid who plays this game could find at least one character that resonates with them. They even got Kenny Kawaguchi in there. Like, mad props to the dev team behind this game because they have my respect. Backyard Sports was never my personal favorite as I found myself drawn more to the adventure games than the sports series, but I can't deny the sheer level of fame that these titles accrued during their life cycle. But wait, the announcements don't stop there because in November of 1997, Humongous Entertainment also announced that it would be partnering with Nickelodeon for a five-year deal in order to produce CD-ROM titles of the hit preschool series, Blue's Clues. And Blue's Clues was my jam when I was younger, so these games were right up my alley, but my parents never bought me any of them. Sad, I know, but apparently this was a very popular request that parents were asking for at the time. Tom Ashheim said in an article for the LA Times that parents had asked Nickelodeon to develop a CD-ROM based on the show so kids who already leap up and point at the screen to tell Steve where the clue is would be able to fully interact with the characters. Tom was Nickelodeon's vice president of business development, publishing, and multimedia at the time. And I'm inclined to agree. It actually makes perfect sense when you think about it, considering the show basically asks the kids to point at the screen anyways. They may as well just be given the ability to click on things. It's actually genius. The model of the show perfectly matches the types of adventure games that Humongous was already creating. No wonder this pairing feels like a dream come true. Yep, 1997 was one hell of a year for Humongous Entertainment, and by 1998, Humongous had the top two best-selling games in the educational category, against larger competitors like Disney, The Learning Company, and Broderbund. As of July of that year, the total number of employees at the company had surged to upwards of 320 according to the New York Times. Both 1998 and 1999 carried on the trend of successful adventure titles with Freddy Fish 3, Pajama Sam 2, More Blues Clues, Backyard Soccer, Putt Putt Enters the Race, Freddy Fish 4, Backyard Football, and Spy Fox 2, among other spin-off titles as well. By the year 2000 in particular, Humongous had sold more than 16 million copies copies of all of these games. They were no pushover and had grown immensely since starting as the small independent software developer from Woodenville, Seattle. Considering all of the work that had to go into each and every game, and for the company to be at a point where it was releasing two to three adventure games a year on top of the Backyard Sports series and other merchandise like toys, books, etc., it's no wonder the company continued to grow to such a high level. For each game, this team is required to create hundreds of thousands of frames, even more for the sports games due to the multiple characters and hundreds of possible on-screen interactions. A junior adventure game, such as the new Spy Fox title scheduled for release in the first quarter of 2001, may have two to three times as many frames as a half-hour cartoon show. That's a lot of animating for just one computer game. Things seemed to be going great for the company by the end of the 1990s, but unfortunately the same cannot be said for its parent company, GT Interactive. In 1999, they had posted losses of over $90 million in the first quarter alone due to restructuring costs, and they continued to lose revenue dramatically as the year went on. Things were going south quick, and despite Humongous's, well, humongous success, it wasn't an enough to save their parent company from going under. Enter Infogrames, who came swooping in at the end of 1999 and purchased a 70% stake in the company for $135 million on top of taking over its debt of $10.5 million. Quite frankly, I'm not sure what Infogrames was thinking in doing this, but they were clearly interested and seized the opportunity while the iron was hot. For Humongous, however, this was the beginning of the end.
Infogrames, better known as the destroyer of all things sacred, was a company founded in France by Bruno Bonnell and Christophe Sapet in June of 1983. The company initially got off to a rocky start due to investors not wanting to sink their money into a brand new, untested market at the time. This of course changed when the early 90s rolled around and Infogrames began developing games for the SNES and Nintendo Game Boy, with the release of Alone in the Dark in 1992 putting them on the map. Right around the same time GT Interactive came to be. In 1993, the company was publicly floated and grew exponentially to the point that there were 61 million share requests made for the mere 115,000 that were available at the time. Later that year, Infograme saw the release of the everlasting hit title Mist, which continued to carry the company to new heights. By the end of 1994, Infogrames was the biggest French video game developer ever, even bigger than Ubisoft at the time, as hard as that might be to believe. In 1996, Infogrames purchased Ocean Software, and in 97, it purchased Philips Media, making it the dominant game developer and publisher in all of Europe. It also purchased up Ozsoft, giving the company some presence in Australia. Infogrames continued to purchase more and more companies throughout 1998 and 1999, swallowing up all of these independent studios that probably could have gone on to make some incredible games had Infogrames not been prone to tampering with everything it possibly could. Yeah, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I really have a bone to pick with the way Infogrames utterly decimated the gaming market. Some of the stuff they did is downright frustrating, as you'll see soon enough. Come the end of 1999, GT Interactive found itself knee-deep in a pile of debt, and things weren't looking too hot. By this point, Cave Dog Entertainment had been shut down after only producing Total Annihilation and its Fantasy Kingdom reskin, and three titles that were in development all had to be scrapped. There was a first-person shooter named Amen the Awakening, and two adventure titles named Elysium and Good and Evil. I would have loved to see how all three of those games turned out, because they all sound really interesting, but sadly they never came to be. Cave Dog was an offshoot that had tons of potential, but ultimately fell victim to unforeseen circumstances outside of its control that forced it to close down by the fall of 1999. Cave Dog truly was, as they say, a one-hit wonder. Infogrames, however, saw this as a prime opportunity and seized the company for themselves by acquiring a 70% stake in the company worth $135 million whilst also taking on that $10 million debt that they had accumulated. By January of 2000, GT had ceased to exist and the men and women of Humongous Entertainment found themselves beholden to an overseas boss with a spring-loaded armadillo as its mascot. Infogrames justified this purchase of GT by using it as a gateway into the US market and acquiring the rights to popular hit titles like Duke Nukem and Driver, which they hardly did anything with and is the reason why it ironically took forever for Duke Nukem Forever to ever be released. This company was buying up all of these smaller publishers with the intent of becoming the world's largest video game publisher in the world. But as time would go on to show, they got a little too big for their britches and ended up digging themselves deeper and deeper into the ground. And considering how many companies they destroyed in the process of doing this, I don't have any sympathy for them. I've come to discover that this company single-handedly ruined some of the greatest video game and software publishers in the industry at the time. Not just Humongous, but Accolade, Hasbro Interactive, other GT Interactive titles, the list goes on. In 2001, Infogrames purchased Hasbro Interactive for $100 million, which included Dungeons & Dragons, Microprose, and Atari. This gave them possession of popular hit titles like Civilization, Monopoly, Roller Coaster Tycoon, Centipede, Tonka, Pong, and so on. This strengthened Infogrames' position as one of the largest and most powerful computer game publishers at the time. But it also made Humongous less of a priority now that it was being outsold by other IPs the company owned. And trust me, I was a fan of Hasbro Interactive games too. I used to play Tonka Construction and Roller Coaster Tycoon all the time as a kid, so the fact that Infogrames managed to ruin not one, but two of my favorite children's software companies really stings. And now I suppose I need to set the record straight, because here is where things get a little confusing. Let me be the first to say that Infogrames absolutely sucked at naming their subsidiaries, because this web of companies is downright confusing if you don't pay close enough attention to it. Up until this point, we've been dealing solely with Humongous Entertainment, who was purchased by GT Interactive in 1996. Then, as we just established, GT was purchased by Infogrames at the end of 1999. 
After this purchase, Infogrames rebranded GT Interactive to Infogrames Incorporated. I should also mention that the original Infogrames full company name was Infogrames Entertainment Société Anonyme, although the French terminology is abbreviated as SA. As such, from this point forward, I will be referring to the original French parent company that purchased GT Interactive as Infogrames SA. So, Infogrames SA renames GT to Infogrames Incorporated, seeing as it was now the company's North American subsidiary. After this rebrand, Infogrames merged Infogrames North America Incorporated, formerly Accolade, which was also purchased earlier in 1999, into Infogrames Incorporated. Later, in 2001, when Infogrames SA purchased Hasbro Interactive, as I had mentioned, they chose to rename that company to Infogrames Interactive Incorporated, a separate company from Infogrames Incorporated, both under the parent company Infogrames SA, which was based in Europe. Seeing as Hasbro Interactive owned the Atari Corporation at the time, which was now an Infogrames possession, they renamed that to Atari Interactive Incorporated, a subsidiary of Infogrames Interactive Incorporated, which was a separate entity from Infogrames Incorporated, the branch that owned Humongous Entertainment, which was also merged with Infogrames North America Incorporated, formerly Accolade, all of which were under one parent company, Infogrames SA. Like I said, these guys sucked at naming their subsidiaries. And to make matters worse, they did such a poor job restructuring all of this that it all came crashing down after a mere three years of owning Humongous Entertainment. In the fiscal year of 2002, Infogrames SA had a net loss of $67 million on revenues of $650 million. And in 2003, the net losses increased to $89 million. In 2006, Infogrames SA reported a net loss of $200 million on revenues of $525 million, and debts of around $290 million. From 1999 to 2006, Infogrames SA accumulated losses over $500 million. They began shutting down studios and selling away the rights to all of these IPs that they swooped up just a few years prior. Hasbro bought back the digital rights to the Hasbro-specific properties like My Little Pony and Transformers, so at least most of those were saved aside from Dungeons & Dragons. Infogrames SA closed down several companies like Legend Entertainment and Microprose, selling away the rights to Civilization to Take-Two Interactive. Infogrames SA must have realized how stupidly confusing their naming schemes were because in 2003, they decided to rebrand Infogrames Inc. to Atari Inc. and Infogrames Interactive Inc. to Atari Interactive Inc. I guess Atari was a more recognizable name in the States than Infogrames, so at the very least there was some way to now distinguish between both companies and the parent Infogrames SA. But then of course in 2008 they just bought out the remaining portion of Atari Incorporated and merged both subsidiaries into the parent company, renaming themselves to Atari SA one year later and hosting everything all under one roof. So where does Humongous fit into all of this? Well, truthfully, by 2001, the company wasn't doing so hot. The article I found by the Washington Post was published in June of that year and has some very alarming statistics about the current state of the educational software market at the time. Sales have plummeted from the $600 million the educational software industry grossed in 1999. Through May of this year, 7.8 million units were sold, generating $132 million in revenue. While in the same period in 1999, 10 million units flew off the shelves for $210 million in revenue. And in 2000, 8.8 .8 million units were sold, bringing in $175 million. Educational software also claims less of an overall software market, 13.3% today, down from the 20% in 1999. The number of new titles being released each year was also dropping at a staggering rate, 912 in 1998 to 678 in 2000. This was also the result of fewer publishing companies existing to make these titles in the first place. A lot were either being swallowed up by bigger entities, shifting to a new market, or dying out because they weren't financially viable anymore. At one point, a few months after Infogrames acquisition of the company, Ron Gilbert and Shelley Day were in talks of buying back the company they had founded back in 1992 and returning it to its roots by having the company act as a small, self-contained developer. According to various sources, they had already discussed the idea with the CEO of Infogrames at the time and had earned their blessing, so things seemed to be smooth sailing. 
However, in a freak twist of fate, and I really mean freak, Ron and Shelly were forced to cancel their purchase because the exact same day that they were going to acquire the company, the NASDAQ dropped a whopping 10% as the tech industry found itself losing companies rapidly due to decreased sales. If you want an example of the worst possible timing, that was it. Shortly thereafter, the two announced to the rest of their employees that they would be leaving the company and moving on to something else now that Humongous was heading in a new direction that made the future seem bleak. Humongous still released a few games at the very start of the new decade, Pajama Sam 3, Backyard Baseball 2001, Putt-Putt Joins the Circus, Spy Fox 3, and Freddy Fish 5. Sadly, however, Freddy Fish 5 would be the last Humongous title released before a shocking twist that would change the fate of the company forever. June 13th, 2001 was a day like any other for Humongous Entertainment's 200 employees. And to possibly get amped up for the release of Freddy Fish 5, which was just coming out less than a week later. Early in the day, the entire staff received a vague but slightly concerning email from upper management. Important announcement to all Humongous employees. We are conducting a mandatory all-day company staff meeting off-site tomorrow. All employees except technical support are required to attend. The meeting will start at 9 o'clock. Please be prompt. Directions to the hotel are below, and there will be copies of directions in the lobby. Of course, many of the employees weren't quite sure what this was alluding to at first. Sometime around lunch later that day, the company received a second email stating that there would be a network shutdown at 3 p.m., and the employees were asked to leave the office immediately and take the rest of the day off. As a former Humongous employee recalls, the mood around the office had completely shifted in a matter of hours, as many people began to fear for the worst. The next day, on June 14th, 2001, employees were gathered at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Linwood, Washington, where they were instructed to line up single file and wait for everybody to arrive. Every person was then filtered based on a written list of names into one of two rooms, Mount Baker or Mount Rainier, named after famous mountains located in the state. Those that were filtered into the Mount Baker conference room were then given the news that they were all fired on the spot. Just like that. Thanos must have gotten all the Infinity Stones that day because in the snap of the fingers, nearly half the company's staff was wiped out. To make matters worse for the terminated employees, they were forced to schedule individual appointments to collect their belongings as they had to be overseen by a personal escort to prevent the possibility of theft. There were dozens of assets, artwork, documents, code, etc. that were never recovered and likely locked away forever never to be seen again. To say that this was an unceremonious way to break the news to 40% of the company's staff that they no longer had jobs has got to be an understatement, and I can only imagine what both they and the ones who got to keep their jobs must have felt like sitting in in those rooms. I mean, to go to all this trouble to filter the entire company into a hotel just to say, you're fired, or your friends are fired? As one unnamed artist put it in an article from Kitsap Sun that was published just a few days after the event, The unceremonious layoff was hideous. It was the most hideous way to do it. We were family. We made family games. Worst of all was the way the staffers were set into separate rooms at the hotel. Those keeping their jobs to the right, those being offered severance pay and helping formulating resumes to the left. Nancy Bushkin, spokeswoman for Infogrames, said that the company decided to deactivate key cards and conduct the bad news meeting off-site to make the situation more orderly. But I don't know. This just sounds like it took less effort on the management's behalf because they didn't have the guts to talk to these people one-on-one, -on -one, and instead thought it would be faster and less personal to get it over with by shoving everyone in a room and dropping the news in bulk. Talk about a coward's way out. And it certainly doesn't help that the company announced it would be shelving all adventure game titles from that point on. All remaining humongous employees were to focus solely on the backyard sports titles effective immediately. Why'd backyard sports stick around while the other games got shelved? Because those games were more cost efficient and made the most amount of money. It was purely a financial decision to uproot what was once a beloved children's software company and turn it into a cash cow that only produced one game series every year. At one point, employees were told they were not allowed to even send company-wide goodbye emails because there were too many being sent. Well, gee, maybe that was because 82 people just got laid off out of the blue. And what makes it even more shocking is that despite the market for children's edutainment experiencing a bit of a dip, Humongous's games were still selling well. Freddy Fish 5 ended up being the second best-selling adventure game of 2001, according to PC data, and many of Humongous's other titles were still selling well too.
This layoff announcement led to the cancellation of numerous projects, many of which are probably still unknown to this day. People were able to recover a demo for a 3D hybrid game called A Gas Pocket Adventure, Aliens Ate My Cookies, some time ago, but sadly because of Infogrames' interference, it was never fully realized. The reason for this was, get this, the fact that Infogrames did not have faith in a game starring a female protagonist. Even though Freddy Fish was a game with a female protagonist and was a colossal success, but corporate figureheads, am I right? It's all about the money to them. They don't care about anything else. Speaking of, the talk of releasing a Freddy Fish 6 was also canned, with former employees stating that there were a few possibilities for it at the time. One recalls something about it being tied to a pirate adventure that was going to be presented in a 3D style of some sort, since those graphics were becoming popular at the time. I wasn't at the level to hear about decisions like this, but my impression is that we would have made more games with all the characters if we had the chance. There were so many creative people at Humongous, I'm sure people had more adventures in mind. But the games were really expensive to make with all that hand-drawn animation, and trying to do it more cheaply was unsatisfying. There was also the problem that the audience was shrinking over the years as kids were playing games meant for older kids instead of games like ours. Kids were getting older, younger was the phrase. Dolls, etc. faced the same problem. And then there is the fact that the old games were still really good but could be found much cheaper. If Freddy 6 would cost $20 but Freddy 3 was only 5, maybe more and more people just wait for the games to get cheaper before buying the newer ones, so it makes less sense to make them from a business perspective. So the business decision on whether to make more was probably getting harder. Lastly, the creative designers also had ideas for new characters, and we could only make so many games at once, so that could slow down the new games with older characters. But if Humongous would have lasted longer, I'm sure there would have been another Freddy game. We all loved Freddy and Luther and were never short of ideas. Alas, at this point Humongous was forced to produce backyard sports titles, but Ron Gilbert and Shelley Day weren't giving up just yet. They may not have been able to buy back Humongous Entertainment, but they did manage to start up a new company named Hullaby Entertainment. Hullaby came about as an opportunity for Gilbert and Day to start with a clean slate, both technologically and creatively. They wanted to focus on doing games that could be downloaded over the internet and to be able to create a new cast of characters and stories. They were also looking to move out of the Scum system, which had become outdated by 2002. Thankfully, due to a deal with Disney, they managed to form the company with their games being published by Plaid Banana Entertainment, a new division of Disney Interactive created solely for the purpose of marketing and distributing Hullaby's titles. The company launched themselves with two distinct games, Moop and Dreadly in the Treasure on Bing Bong Island and Allo in the Sunny Valley Fair. Both games play like typical humongous adventure games with the point and click gameplay players were used to by this point. And while I haven't played these titles for myself, they come across to me as not having the same charm and allure that the original Humongous titles had. I mean no offense when I say this, but Hullaby comes across as a diet Humongous. I appreciate the attempt to try and recreate the same aura that the original company had, but I just don't think it worked out here. Moop and Dreadly I can best describe as a Calvin and Hobbes type of scenario, and while I appreciate Allo going for a clay-like art style, the character design itself is extremely bland as he is just a blue ball and nothing more. The characters just don't have the same appeal that the four big humongous properties did. Hullaby sadly did not manage to produce that many games during its ever so short lifespan. Other than these two titles, the company also produced a Cocoa Puffs game, Mike's Monstrous Adventure, and Piglet's Big Game. There is a forum post out there documenting some lesser known Hullaby titles that existed on their website, but otherwise this is all the company had amounted to before it shut down. Why did it shut down? Well, that is quite the story in and of itself. Come December of 2005, Shelley Day was convicted of bank fraud and sentenced to 30 months in prison, followed by an additional five years of supervised release. The official justice.gov website has full documentation on the lawsuit, breaking down the chain of events as follows. Over the course of a year, Day defrauded Asia Europe America's Bank of Seattle of more than 1.5 million, claiming she was selling a portion of Hula Bee Entertainment to Disney Interactive in order to secure loans. Day did this with the intent to purchase a $3 million dream home on Mercer Island, just off the coast of Washington State, however the purchase was never completed. According to court records, Day repeatedly misled the bank, providing forged documents to bolster her applications for large loans. 
In March 2002, Day told the bank loan officer that Hula Bee Entertainment was going to be sold to Disney Interactive. Day even presented a phony letter of intent from Disney and other supporting documents that indicated she would receive $2.5 million from the sale. After the bank agreed to that loan, and later loaned her additional funds, Day fell behind and ultimately stopped making payments. She told the bank that the sale of her company was being renegotiated, and again provided forged documents. She falsely claimed Disney Interactive had been acquired by Vivendi Universal Publishing, which therefore delayed the sale of her company. Again, she produced forged documents from Vivendi Universal Publishing to bolster her fraud. Day asked bank officials not to contact Disney or Vivendi, saying that would jeopardize the deals. After a year of Day misleading the bank, a lawyer for the bank contacted Disney and discovered it was all a sham. This conviction is likely the reason why the company went silent following the release of Piglet's Big Game, seeing as their business license expired in 2003, yet it took until 2005 for a final verdict to be reached. Gilbert had also departed from the company before July of 2003, although whether this was due to the fraud situation or other reasons, I was unable to discover. Meanwhile, over at Humongous around this time, one employee found himself knee-deep in the development of a title named Moonbase Commander. Moonbase was a game unlike any title Humongous had ever released before, a real-time strategy set on the surface of a lunar base with the mission of eliminating the opponent before they eliminate you. Creator Rhett Mathis saw this as a passion project of his, and while at first he was developing the title in secret, he was later approved by his programming manager to give the game a shot. This was a title made with the intent of recapturing the audience that had grown out of the adventure games they were playing just a few years ago. An article on the website Gamma Sutra tells of the entire story and it is a very interesting read for anyone looking to learn more, but Moonbase Commander was the most promising failure that Humongous had ever produced while under Infogrames. Surprise, surprise, what could have been a successful smash hit was turned into a financial failure because of the absurd corporate meddling that doomed the title before it ever even hit store shelves. When Rhett went to pitch the idea of the game to the vice president of Infogrames Incorporated at the time, the VP suggested he change the setting from a moon base to a garden. Why? Heck if I know, apparently this guy thought that gardens were more appealing to kids and teenagers than moon bases. I don't know. Luckily, that never ended up happening, and the game kept its original setting. One thing is clear to me from reading this article. The executives at Infogrames Incorporated were some of the most out-of-touch corporate figureheads I think I've ever heard of. When Rhett went to pitch the game to the executives that would approve or deny its release, they took one look at it and just suggested they ship it as is, before the game was even finished. On another separate occasion, an executive tried giving a pep talk to the entire humongous staff by showing them footage of the game Kingdom Hearts, which had released at the time, and told them that they should try making a game like it. Not realizing that Kingdom Hearts was like 20 times the budget of a humongous game and was far beyond their capabilities with their currently available resources, on top of the fact that these same executives had laid off 40% of their staff less than a year prior, which meant less hands working on the game, which meant more time would be needed to complete something like that. It's like they magically thought they could just press a make Kingdom Hearts button and have the product on the shelves. This sort of ignorance created a massive drop in morale rather than a pep talk for Rhett and other humongous employees at the time, and I completely understand why. It's honestly a miracle that company got as big as it was with all of the stupidly asinine decisions they were making. To make matters worse for Moonbase, Infogrames did not show the game off at E3 at all despite it launching weeks after the fact. They hardly marketed the game, and when they did, they directed it towards young children rather than the intended teenage demographic. Reading up on this fills me with a feeling of disdain and contempt towards Infogrames that I cannot even describe. It's so frustrating learning about these remarkably terrible business decisions. They were literally throwing money away. Moonbase Commander released to critical acclaim. It was recognized by all sorts of outlets as the best game that nobody played that year. At the end of 2002, an executive confirmed that Moonbase was a financial failure, and rather than accept that it was probably the executives that screwed them over by failing to market the game, they probably just blamed the game itself for not selling well. Ron Gilbert himself expressed how important he realized marketing was for a game to do well when interviewed by Night Dive Studios. 
At Humongous, Shelly dealt with the business end of things, and I dealt with the creative end of things. It was a good division because I'm not a business guy, but I learned a lot from watching the business people. We hired a VP of marketing and a VP of sales, and I really saw firsthand the amazing influence that these people had on our success. It's not just that if you make a great game, people will flock to buy it. They won't, and that's even true today. If nobody can discover your game, it's not going to sell. If you have good marketing people who respect the creative process, it's a wonderful marriage. And we had that. Clearly, Infogrames did not respect the creative process. But Infogrames incompetence didn't stop there. There was a sparkle of hope that reignited when the company, now rebranding themselves as Atari Incorporated as mentioned earlier, greenlit two junior adventure titles for Humongous to release in 2003. Putt Putt Pep's Birthday Surprise and Pajama Sam 4, Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff. Unfortunately, however, these titles did not live up to the quality of previous games due to a varying degree of factors that were primarily the fault of the parent company not providing the staff with enough time and resources to tidy up the finished product. What a surprise. Benjamin Young had some very interesting insight to share on the Humongous Alumni Facebook page, stating that hand-drawn animation being expensive coupled with the fact that there were so many costs spread between CD distribution, stores getting a cut of the sales, infogrames getting a cut of the sales while giving nothing in return, and the fact that the games were only sold for like $20 each, meant that a lot of copies had to be sold for the company to turn any profit. Infogrames at the time didn't want small profits, they wanted the big money. And despite Despite humongous games being of higher quality and better reviewed, they were more interested in the release of the absolutely atrocious Matrix game that came out at the time. Like, oh my lord, how did this company get so big given the sheer foolishness of the decisions that they made? Gilbert himself went on record stating that Infogrames decimated what made the company really special. Sure enough, the games didn't turn out that great, and that pretty much meant the end of the Junior Adventure series as a whole. By June of 2005, Atari Incorporated had laid off almost the entire company's staff, with the remaining core group managing the external development of all humongous games, starting with Backyard Sports. They claimed there was another business strategy for other humongous characters, but that was never realized. Ron Gilbert at this time made a post on his online blog Grumpy Gamer, stating that humongous entertainment was, quote, my greatest achievement and my greatest failure. It's a sad day. Later in the year, Atari Incorporated sold Humongous to its parent company Infogrames SA in 2005 for $10.3 million, a massive decrease compared to the GT Interactive purchase in 1996. This deal was made under the condition that all titles that were currently being developed by Humongous Entertainment were released before March 31st, 2006. And no titles were released in that time, and the company was completely dissolved the day after. Talk about a terrible April Fool's joke. Infogrames SA then transitioned the label and assets to a new company named, get this, Humongous Incorporated, which continued the Backyard Sports series up through 2010. Also during this time period, a deal was made with Majesco and Mystic Software so that they could port three of Humongous Entertainment's original hit titles to the Nintendo Wii, Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam, and Spy Fox 1. They each sold for $20 a pop, and I distinctly remember seeing all three of these games in various GameStop stores back around 2008 when they came out. Unfortunately though, I never bought any of them, which might have been a good thing in retrospect because they're actually terrible ports, all things considered. In December of that year, here, however, the Scum Team, the group of people currently behind the Scum engine that was used to create the original games back in the mid-1990s, had learned that those Wii ports were released without proper attribution. E.g., the ports failed to credit that Scum was used in the game. This led to the Scum Team contacting GPLviolations.org while Nintendo themselves investigated the claims as their license agreements prevented the use of open source software on the Wii. Upon discovering that these ports violated their license agreement, a settlement was made in 2009 where the Scum Team agreed to drop the charges on the condition that Majesco and Mystic destroy all copies of the games, make a donation to the Free Software Foundation, and paying all of the legal fees. The last game released under the humongous name was Backyard Football 2010. After that, the company went silent for three years before some groundbreaking news was announced in January of 2013. Atari was filing for bankruptcy. 
Atari has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The 31 year old company that launched games like Pong, Space Invaders, and Asteroids is looking to separate its U.S. corporation, its operation, from its money losing parent company now. The company wants to sell off its logo and video game titles as well. According to the filing, Atari is seeking more than $5 million in new financing. The company still owns more than 200 games that can be played on consoles and mobile devices as well. By 2013, Atari SA found itself in a precarious position. It owed numerous amounts of money in debt and was failing to bring in enough revenue in order to stay afloat. By late 2012, it had seen that the company was accepting its fate, which led to the company filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States in order to separate and sell off its American assets from the French parent company so that the primary business could stay afloat. Amongst this filing came the selling of Humongous Entertainment to Tomo Incorporated, a smaller video game publisher primarily known for the revival of the lackluster video game series Bubsy. This purchase finally freed Humongous Entertainment from the cold, dead grasp of Atari SA, which was already a net positive by default, and by March of 2014, Tomo had completed its acquisition of the entire Humongous Entertainment brand. Aside from Backyard Sports, which was picked up by the Evergreen Group, and Moonbase Commander, which went to Rebellion Developments. Tomo has done a better job at managing the Humongous image than Atari SA ever did seeing as they didn't ruin people's livelihoods, and relaunched the Humongous website in early 2014 with a new look and logo, advertising all of the old computer games that the company had produced in the 1990s and early 2000s. The company also teamed up with Night Dive Studios in order to port almost every single Humongous game they owned to Steam, iOS, and Android devices, releasing a handful of games in waves at a time over the course of 2014 and 2015. And the brand has been in purgatory ever since. Unfortunately, despite Tomo's efforts to bring the older titles to modern platforms, they have yet to release a single new title under their new ownership as of the release of this video. The only recognized activity from Humongous comes in the form of what appears to be one annual update to the website each year, and infrequent tweets on the official Twitter account announcing when occasional sales go live on Steam or holiday artwork. Other than that, Tomo seems to have done nothing with Humongous Entertainment other than allow it to remain dormant with minimal hope of a future game release. The closest we ever came was with a teaser announcement of various Humongous Entertainment titles getting ported to the Nintendo Switch in the spring of 2019. But two years after the fact, and nothing has ever come of this announcement whatsoever. Sadly, as time goes on, Humongous seems to continue to fade further and further into obscurity. Years go by, no new titles get produced, and activity seems to become less and less frequent on Tomo's side of things. In today's culture, Pablo Sanchez may remain as iconic as ever, but I see less and less people recognizing the sheer level of achievements that the company's adventure titles managed to obtain back at the height of their popularity. At this point in time, who knows if a new humongous entertainment game could be successful. With the current gaming market getting flooded with mobile games, children's entertainment software has mostly become a thing of the past and I honestly wouldn't want the brand to just shift to mobile gaming specifically. As much as I'd like to believe that a new humongous title could be successful today, I have very low expectations we will ever see anything of the sort. At the very least, the Steam versions do exist for people who are nostalgic for the older titles, and possibly even for the parents that played these games when they were kids that want to share them with their kids. After all, despite being produced in the 90s, the games have an almost timeless quality to them. Most of them still hold up today thanks to the choice in art style and lack of reliance on shoving in the latest trends at the time. Putt Putt, Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam, and Spy Fox are all just as endearing as ever, and continue to show off just how brilliant adventure games can be, not just for young ages, but for adventure game players in general. In an ideal world, I'd love for the original staff members at Humongous to possibly be given the opportunity to work on a game again. For old time's sake, I think that'd be a dream come true. As it stands, however, it is likely nothing more than a dream. I am grateful for everything Humongous Entertainment did for me as a child growing up during the peak of their popularity because their games helped shape me into the person that I am today. I will always hold these games close to me as some of my earliest video game experiences and still look back on them fondly every once in a while. I've been wanting to make a video on these games for years at this point, 
And now that we're here at the end, I can finally say that I've done it. Getting to learn the entire history of the company from beginning to end, and getting to share it with all of you. Now that we're here at the end of this, what, over 90 minute long journey, I hope you've come to appreciate Humongous Entertainment more as a game developer, whether you were a fan or not before watching this video. And hey, if you've never experienced these games before and either want to try them out for yourself, or have a child that's looking for some new games to play, then definitely consider getting them on Steam. You won't be disappointed. As for me, this is only the beginning of my discussion on Humongous Entertainment. This video may have provided context for what Humongous was, but I didn't have the opportunity to truly dive deep into each individual game. That's why I'm excited to say that this video is only part one of an eight-part series I'm making to tackle every single Humongous Entertainment game ever made. Now that the origins of the company have been explored, it's time for me to tackle part two of this massive retrospective series by taking a look at the Putt-Putt franchise and all of the various titles that were released from 1992 to 2003. Tune in next time to witness my coverage of the entire timeline of the Putt-Putt series, from Putt-Putt Joins the Parade all the way up to Pep's Birthday Surprise. It's sure to be a good one. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, Shadow Streak, signing off. Shadow, this was really long. I can't believe you made me read all this. I don't even know what this video is about, but uh, I hope that was good. Uh, good luck with the video. This sounds interesting. Uh, saying Vivendi Universal is kind of hard. It's a weird word, Vivendi Universal, Vivendi Universal, Vivendi Universal. Take care, buddy.